Welcome, everyone. Welcome. So I am Jennifer Stadium with the Indian Education for All unit at the Montana Office of Public Instruction. Welcome to our fifth Indian Education for All Ethnobotany webinar with Raina Monteau. I am so excited for her presentation tonight. It's going to be a little bit different from the rest, so I hope you all enjoy it, enjoy it too. Uh, we do have many uh, from near and far joining us this evening. Uh, this is a webinar series created for Montana's pre-K through higher ed teachers. Please bear that in mind as you listen to the presentation. And uh, questions from the Q&A will be posted to the presenter in the order of relevance to classroom instruction, but please do capitalize on the question and answer section um, outside of the chat. I don't normally uh, monitor the chat, but I do see when the questions and answers come up. So utilize that Q&A and we'll make sure to get your questions answered. So for those of us from uh, far away or, or newly joining us tonight, the history of Indian education for all. In 1972, Montana became the first state as it revised its constitution to enact a law called Indian Education for All, stating that all Montanans, regardless of age and background, be taught about the distinct and unique cultural heritage of each Montana tribe. In the Indian Education for All unit at the Montana Office of Public Instruction, we create resources and professional development opportunities such as this to support K-12 Indian Education for All in meaningful, respectful, and tribally specific ways in all content areas. I choose to do land acknowledgments because it means something to me to let, rest my feet on this land. And so in the spirit of healing, I acknowledge and honor the original peoples of the southwestern Montana, Helena, Montana area, the Salish, Blackfeet, Kootenai, and other tribal nations, Crow, Northern Cheyenne, Chippewa Cree, Nez Pierce, Nakota, Dakota, Little Shell, Assiniboine, Shoshone, and many other indigenous people who call it home, past, present, or future. Again, please make sure to take advantage of the Q&A. We are recording this for future use. So if you have to leave early or you want to share this with a colleague, it will be up in our playlist in just a few days. That link is actually in your, in your uh, reminder letter. Um, again, the sign-in sheet is open. Please, if you're seeking renewal units, please sign that. Otherwise, put your name in chat so we can see where you're from. And uh, the feedback survey will open up the last 10 minutes of the webinar and will only remain open for 24 hours. So please do make sure to fill out that feedback survey, whether or not you're seeking renewal units. We really do read every comment every time and really try to improve on our webinars going forward. Our presenters have been just wonderful about adapting um, to your needs and requests. So it is now my great pleasure to introduce my dear friend, Raina Monto. Raina is Nakota and a fifth generation educator on these lands. She serves with all her heart as principal of Hayes Logical Schools. Raina started teaching in 2007 and arrived in Hayes Logical in 2015, where she immediately started an alternative school to serve native youth who would benefit from a more flexible and successful framework. As I mentioned, she is now the principal and has been since 2019, and she is currently working on implementing a mental health tiered system of support at her school, which assists in providing curriculum and professional development of culturally responsive, scientifically proven mental health supports for teachers to use with their daily instruction. With this, the Aani and Nakota culture and language are embedded into the core curriculum, the culture and the language classes and everyday practices. Her ethnobotanical passion is foods and medicines and foods used as medicines. Uh, I love. She also loves to explore the literature that explains medicines and foods Nakota families used and how they were prepared. Raina, welcome and thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us this evening. What a gift we are in for. Hi, welcome. Hi, Madagunyabi. Magia Titanganawawia. Zemacha Pejuta Wakan Mato Wase Wakpa and Wati and Wawashi Chinjabi. So my my name is my Indian name is Singing Buffalo Woman. I'm from the uh, Medicine Bear Clan from Lodgepole. I'm also from the Hudesha, uh, Wadopina, and the Stony. Um, so all the bands in of Nakota and uh, Montana, I'm part of those bands. Um, 
I uh, became interested in plants um, probably growing up. I grew up down the valley. We call it down the valley. It's in the uh, river bottom, Milk River River bottom. Uh, I lived in the country all my life down there on the river. And we um, had neighbors that were elderly neighbors like Lena, Lena Bucks now, her granddaughter what is Alma Snell and um, her grandmother was Pretty Shield and um, Emma Lane Ball. We also had uh, to the west of us would be the weasels and to the east of us, the horns and earth boys. There's a lot of people, a lot of people, a lot of uh, Nakotas down on the river there. And uh, we were kind of the younger generation that lived there. My dad was was a younger generation that lived there. And so um, the elders took us in, a lot of them. My sister would go to different places and visit. And we learned a lot from, from just our relatives down the valley. Um, it just gives you, it just gave us a kind of a, a base to, to live by uh, when you grow up around elders. And so I wanted to open my presentation with uh, a story. And so part of part of my, uh, I guess, love for for medicinal plants in um, our Nakota culture is just uh, being a woman, and uh, just being a woman, just sharing that time with other women. It it creates a strong relationship uh, when you sit down and you uh, drink tea with somebody. Um, usually whenever my aunts or any elders come in, we have some tea and visit and it opens a lot of doors. It uh, helps everybody kind of become family. And so I wanted to share something that, it, that, um, that I always take with me when, when I present. And when I first started teaching, I had these in my classroom. They're little dolls that my aunt made. This one in my aunt is Georgine Weasel. And so she made, she made these, she always made these. And so here's the little woman doll. And she makes this all out of, uh, you know, just fabric. This is a, she makes the body and the hair out of yarn. And then all the little pieces that go with it. This is the breastplate and about necklaces in a traditional uh, ribbon dress. And then I call her Rosie Weasel. We always called her Rosie Weasel. And this is Millard, Millard Weasel. This is her husband. And so there's a little ribbon shirt. And um, I bring these with us because for me, when we talk about plants or when we talk about things like this, um, it's kind of like a time for short storytelling because uh, during storytelling, or, you know, when you, you're learning about these plants, it's always through story or it's always through sharing with uh, aunt, a mother, somebody, um, and they teach you something more about cooking um, traditionally. And so I bring those with because I like to tell the stories that come that come with the um, teachings, like how did who, who taught me, where were we, things like that. Um, and so my first thing that I wanted to share was my was the creation story. So the creation story to me, it's like made a lot of sense because it brought everything together. Um, and I heard many creation stories, you know, in our, in my lifetime. And I liked, I loved all of them, but this one, I really, I really like it. That, this is the one that made, made the world made sense after, after the story, but there, um, so here, here's the story. So there was a time when um, the, the earth was bare. There was nothing on the earth and just the winds and um, there's no life on earth, just everything but the life on earth. And so the creator was called down to, to the earth and he was circling the earth in all the directions and saying, who, who, who called me here? Who called me here? And so he didn't ever, no one answered him. No, nothing answered him. So the creator just went around and he kind of got bored and he was like, oh, this is, this place is bare. Um, and so 
he called the winds. And so the winds came from all the directions. And when the uh, winds came he to him, he said, uh, my brothers and sisters are my children. You uh, need to go out in your directions and bring me something back. This, this world is vast. I want to see what um, is in what lives in your directions. And so the winds went into all four directions. And so one, uh, one of the winds brought back a stone. So then we had, we had a stone. And then one of the winds brought, brought back just like a, a, some earth, some, some soil, part the soil. And then another one of the winds from a, a, a different direction and brought back a piece of ice. And the, the last wind came and said, I have nothing for you. I, they brought everything. I do not have anything. And he said, okay, that's, that's fine. My child will use you as you can be the offering. And so the, the last piece was the wind. And so the creator made a, a um, tornado, Naomi, a tornado. And so he made the tornado on the, um, and as he was making that tornado, he put in uh, the stone. So the stone made a skeleton of a human. And then after the stone, we put the soil into the, into the, um, into the, um, Naomi. And so into the, um, and so the soil made the, the um, flesh of the, of the man. And then um, they put the ice into, to the tornado, the ice went into the tornado and that became the blood. And then the last thing was the, the wind. And then as he was doing, building the tornado and this human was taking form, a star from the heavens dropped into the tornado and it lit, lit up the skeleton. And uh, the last, the wind was put into the, to the tornado and that gave the breath of life. And um, that was, that is how our, our firstborn son, Hokshi Chugapa was created. And so um, Hokshi Chugapa was here on earth and um, the, the creator is really proud of himself and was looking at the, looking at the Hokshi Chugapa, the first bird son, really proud of himself. I made this, I made this, this is my firstborn son. He's really proud and there was a rumbling on earth. And so uh, the rumbling and, um, and it was mother earth and she was upset with the creator. And mother earth told the creator, you are, you're impatient. I was the one who called you here and you're very impatient. And she said, and now that you already made our firstborn son from me, everything that you uh, put inside him was from me, except for the first breath of life in, in the star that, that brought him, his being gave him his soul. Um, and so the creator said, oh, I apologize. What can I do to earn your forgiveness? And so the mother earth said, um, just come to this cave. The mother was speaking out of the cave and outside of the cave, you need to build a fire. And so, um, and um, bring, some water and put the water outside. And after you build the fire, you put your stones on top of the fire. And, um, and then um, when I tell you, you can bring our son, you and your son, our son can enter the, um, the cave. And so the creator followed the directions and built the fire and put the stones on the fire and then uh, put that, water right outside the fire after it was nice and hot and ready then the um, mother earth Mokochi Eina, um, invited Hokshi Tugapa our firstborn son and our creator into the sweat and so the mother in the in the mother and the father and the son, they wanted to talk about the birth of their son. And so they created that ceremony and um, they talked and the creator said, well, you know, I want the, our firstborn son to come back to the heavens with me. 
and uh, the mother agreed that the, the son should go to the heavens, but she wanted him for us to stay with her on earth. And so they, uh, they uh, agreed that he would stay on earth for two days, which is 200 years in heaven. And so the, the creator agreed. And then um, and she said, but the, the father said, there's nothing here. In for our son and said, okay, well, you'll help me then. And together they put everything on earth. And so they, when they brought the water in, the first they brought the stones in and then they brought the water in. And every time they would pour, um, life on earth would populate. And so first it was our plant life, our plant life, all of the medicines and all of the foods and all of the trees, everything that we, you would need to live was put was was put on earth. Every time a drop hit the water, the stones, and the steam come up, then there went there came the mint, there came the echinacea, the black root, there came the cedar, the the sweet grass, the turnips, the the berries, the trees, everything populated the earth in all of the directions. And then they did the two leg, the crawler, the four legged, the crawlers, the winged, and then uh, the two legged in every direction. The earth was populated, and so the the um, son agreed that he would stay on earth and explore the earth and live on earth for the two days which was 200 years in heaven as long as he had a friend and so the creator made um, him a best friend and his best friend was na is named Indomi and so a lot of us know Indomi as being um being a trickster and kind of has bad luck Indomi has bad luck he's fun but it, but Indomi was fun and he showed the creator um, he was his, the creator's partner and Hokshi took Agapa's partner, the firstborn son's partner in life, and he showed him how not to be. And so that's the, that, that creation story is much longer and it sounds way better in Nakoda. And um, then it also talks about the life of um, Hokshi Tugapa and um, Inkdomi and a lot of stories that go with it and how not to be. Um, in life and how to how to be and how not to be in life and so that's that story there tells me where you know where our plants come from our plants were put here to uh, nourish us our plants were put here as medicine and if we only had our plants we would be able to live and we would live very healthy and so that's, um, that story means a lot to me. And so now what we'll do is we'll get into our foods. And so I have, um, I, I have the medicines here with me. I do not have a presentation and I have the medicines here with me, no PowerPoint. It's um, all about the plants. Okay, and so we'll start with the spring. And so in the spring, one of the first plants that um, is available to us is the mint. And the peppermint and the bear mint, it's all over. And so the mint it is found in various places. Um, the peppermint, spearmint, you can find that like on uh, creek beds. And it's like a little plant. It's a little thin plant. The, the stem is really, really skinny. And the, maybe I have one in the middle. You could see how small that it's really skinny, the, the um, stem. Um, and so when the, on the, on the riverbeds, it just kind of crawls. And so you have to, it looks like a big long vine and you just kind of have to look for it. And it's usually in, in the water, you know, you, like a couple inches deep. And then in the mountains, they're usually found on like little, little side hills like at the base of the mountains and so um mint is used for a lot of different things it's mostly used for teas and um and so then uh the tea you could the tea 
it could be a base for a lot of medicines. Um, I've been sick a few times where I've made mint tea with black, which is echinacea, and a little bit of bitter root and you know, maybe, maybe a little bit of bear root and it will kick the, kick your cold before you even get it. And so the, the tea also is used just for, to drink at, with pleasure. And so mint is pronounced cheaga daha, cheaga daha, cheaga daha. And then the tops, so this one is that bear mint, or that, I mean, horse mint, the tops is called wish, wish demo, wish demo. And so this, it's like a purple flower and uh, you can make both of them into teas and you can, you can even use the root if you wanted to really get that little skinny root out, you know, you can use the whole plant, but the um, washdema, so the, tea, the mint itself, it could be a base for a medicine. And then the washdema here is used for a medicine too. It's also used for in ceremonial uses. And so the ceremonial use for Washdema would be to um, my sister Diane, um, Diane Yuki. She came from. She, I I took some pictures and I posted on Instagram, and uh, she's like, "Sister, you have a, so much washdema there." I said, "Come and come and visit." And so she came, and we went and spent the day in the mountains. And she told me what the what this use was for her dad is the late Curly Yuppie. And um, I knew him before I knew her because I was very interested in plants and so was he. And uh, he had a little museum in Poplar. And so I'd go over there all the time. He probably thought I was this little weird kid, go over there all the time and visit him. And he would look, he would show me around the museum, but he always had different types of plants and he'd share, share them. He presented for me many times. I worked at a wellness center. And uh, he presented for me many times. He took us a lot of times um, out to the um, river and stuff to, to pick plants and to harvest. And he showed our, all of our students how to offer tobacco. And so that's something I didn't share. That's how I usually start is um, how do you even get to the point where you want, you know, you pick the plant as medicine or anything, you always uh, um, offer tobacco and you tell the plant what you're going to use it for. And then the plant um, will help you for the use. And so back to the wash stem. And so the stem, she said that they use it in sweat. So they use it before sweat and they, um, you can rub it on yourself. So if you rub that plant on yourself, then it takes the stink of being a human away. And it's, it would be more likely that your, uh, your um, ancestors could hear you and talk to you, um, it, hear you talk to them and they can uh, come back and talk to you also. And so this is used in the sweat or different types of ceremonies. They just, you just rub it on yourself and it takes the, the um, scent of being a human away and get you closer to your creator and closer to your prayers. And that, yeah, and so that plant's available right away. Uh, something I do, if we do, I think we all do it in our school or a lot of the people in our school a lot of the native teachers and maybe all of the native schools in, in um, Montana. But something that we do is we teach, our we teach our students how to offer tobacco, how to take plants, you know, from the, um, take plants from it, the mother and, uh, and then use them in a good way. And so we, what we do is like every summer school, we get um, uh, plants from in, at that time. Yeah, there, there's a little square stem. Yep, the, the mint has a little square stem to it. And it's so tiny, but it's just definitely a little square stem. Um, but what we do is we, in the summertime, we get, uh, we dig turnips, we get a lot of the plants that you mint, the, I like the spearmint in the spring because it's a lot lighter and, um, and, and I like the way it tastes in the spring versus right in the middle of summer, the summer it's pretty strong. Um, and then we keep a lot of the plants. And then throughout the year, when we have visitors, we cook a traditional meal their Native American week. At the end of the week, we have a, a traditional meal for, for our visitors. 
but to teach our students how to cook their traditional meals uh, is really helpful. Why? Because it could connect them. It, first of all, it's free <laughs> and you get everything from your mother earth and they don't have to pay for it. You don't have to pay for it. You have, you could have all of this stuff ready. You can have your ceremonies. You can, um, you can help with ceremonies and this stuff is so valuable. Our elders love it. You know, when we provide the foods, um, and they, um, maybe they're not old or they're too old or they're not able to go out and pick themselves and, but they crave the foods. And so they really appreciate it when we have the foods and we try to teach our kids that our students that, that you should always have these foods. It's free. And it's something that's worth so much so that if you took a pot of dry meat soup to, um, a ceremony or June berries, um, mint tea, the elders would really appreciate you, but you could always do it. You could be, you could, you, it could be a time when you don't have any money and you can provide, a, you know, a buffet of foods to your elders for nothing. And um, you can always ask for help. You can, you know, you'll always have something to give if somebody in your family's sick, you, you can give them your, your foods. You know, you can always ask for help. You can ask, um, you can help your family by getting their names or not just medicine, but their names or to be prayed for or um, to even ask different questions about um, our language in, uh, and it would be all free. So, you don't need to have money to do this. You don't need to be able to go to the store to get the stuff. All you need to do is go out and get it and have it ready for your, or, uh, and you should always have, you should always have this. And so we try to teach our students that. And so throughout the year, we even do go um, take them on a buffalo hunt. And um, we use the meat for the buff uh, from the buffalo hunt throughout the year too. And so um, literally we try to show them that you can be self-sustaining uh, and just show them how. Oh, yeah. okay. All right, so my daughter is here with me because she, she's a language speaker and I wanna be able to share some of the words that I don't know. And so she's going to be tutoring me. You'll, you'll see me kind of on the side talking to her. Okay. Then the next thing that we have, and I, I'm missing a lot of my parts to my plants, but the next thing that we have is our turnips. Our turnips are ready in about June. And so usually I have, um, I have, I make a braid of turnips. This year we had a, we had a kind of a few deaths this year in our family and we I used our turnips throughout the year and so by the time uh fall came for Native American week that was the last of my turnips I used the last of my turnips for Native American week and so here's the base of the this is like it the turnip peeled and then mm -hmm. here is the turnip unpeeled it's like that and so you take this off and then this is the turnip and then you braid, you continue to braid these that until you have a resta of, of turnips and our braid of turnips and then we hang them up and then um, they're preserved. So, so uh, the last time that I cooked uh, dry meat soup this year, I just put that whole braid in um you know the whole thing and and so it's just like really a good way to uh preserve it you you can just and all you have to do is it's dry it takes a good day or so to soften up enough you just throw it in there with your dry meat and cook it for a while and then um and then later you can take your turnips out and cut them or some people just slice them up and put them in their freezer. But um, one of, I never did make the bread, but I saw my aunt or grandma Alma Snell make, make bread out of turnip. And so she gr grinded it to a fine powder and then she made a little tiny, little, they look like little tiny bannocks or little tiny little breads and uh, or really skinny biscuits um, and they were so good and so she she would make the I never tried it yet I just use them 
I like to eat them raw too. They taste like kind of like raw peanuts, raw, but I eat the first one right under the ground. And I, it's like a craving that I have until I dig, walk, dig the, dig the turnip up and then um and then I feel better after that <laughs> you start to crave the foods that you can't get <laughs> unless you go and do some work for them there's things that you can't get at the store and so there there's the turnips and then um and then through Okay, and so then turnips, those are found on the rocky slopes. And so rocky slopes, you know, they allow you, to, they allow uh, pools of water to, to puddle around the plants. And so you find a lot of times you're going to find some of your hardier plants in the rocky slopes. And so uh, it's found in the rocky slopes. And um, then at Fort Peck, they started building these ridding bars that are their rooting bars. They are like, they have, they look like shovels, but there's a pick underneath them. It's a pick instead of a shovel. And it has, um, but it looks pretty much like a shovel. Um, and I, I swear it's like the greatest uh, tool ever because those turnips, if you dig them up, it takes you a little while and you're just like cutting up the earth, you know? But with these ridding bars, it just goes straight down and it just kind of like the turnips just jump out of the ground. And <laughs> one of my friends that sold it to me, he, he was the North uh, Oswego in Black Eagle country. Uh, and he um, he's the one who told me, he's like, I have one for your sister. This one will make the turnips jump right up out of the ground. And uh, I thought he was being pretty dramatic, but when I used it, they definitely jumped right out of the ground. And um, so that, but it was, I guess that tool was invented for uh, echinacea or black fruit, which is found in the same rocky slopes. And here's the root of, of the echinacea. And I do not have the stem, but the stem is just a one stem it's long in the top it kind of has this like this wash stem and it's like that purple because it's called the purple cone flower but it's like that purple but it's a little bit more pink and has a cone on top um and then around here i'm finding um more of the the um, echinacea that doesn't have the purple cone flowers and so i bet was looking for the purple cone flowers and um what i noticed was the the leaves and so what I did was um dug one up and it was a echinacea and so I was like oh my so it just so there's all different kinds but in Fort Peck they have purple cone flowers here they're 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 without the flowers it's just the leaves okay and so the echinacea has a lot of different uses it's used mostly to um to build your immune system up. But uh, the stories that were told a long time ago was that they were used for, um, for snake, snake bite medicine. And so it was like a, all of the echinacea was ground into a powder and uh, the, um, it was stored in the joint of a deer. And so the joint of the deer was cleaned out really good. And then um, a choke cherry plug was used to, to plug it. And then um, the echinacea was just ground into that fine powder and put in there. And so it was, and so they would tie it to the neck of the horse when they were out, you know, and so they had that medicine with them at all times. And so how it, how it was known to, uh, to, um, to kill the medicine or to kill the snake bite was that if the, if a snake would bite, somebody they would lance it they would put that echinacea in there in a whole bunch of um sage and that sage sucks sucks up all of the yucky stuff and then when you um when you take it all out the poison comes with it and you just keep doing that because it the sage will suck everything up and if you ever notice that sage um I grew up down the valley with a lot of mosquitoes. And so with the mosquitoes, you kind of learn different tricks on how to get rid of the itch. 
while with uh, sage, if you get a mosquito bite, you can like get a piece of sage wet in your mouth and put it on your mosquito bite and it will suck out the, the um, whatever makes is making your, um, your bite itch. And so it immediately works. And um, I was always telling my students, different students, you know, we're always sharing with them. And I'm sorry, but I like to tell my little stories in between, but I, I shared my um, story with my little um, class in Brockton. One of the girls got bit and I said, hey, just, I was really telling her what to um, do, put it in your mouth and put it on there. And she's like, oh, Quinn medicine woman, she said, and then she tried it and she put it on there. Oh, Dr. Quinn medicine woman, she is teasing me and she put it on there and then, um, a little while later, hey, it works. I said, I told you. And so with, with my class in Brockton, we did a whole bunch of work with um, plants. And then we wrote a little book and presented it and we made foods, uh, traditional foods. But we took that, uh, we took our plant project to the very extreme. We also, with the echinacea, we also um, did a science project um, with my second grade class. So we made um black and we grew bacteria. And then we tried, um, we did our a science, science project to see if um, echinacea would uh, kill the, the um, really bad bacterias. And so we grew them and we just like looked, you know, we had a Pictura of different types of bacteria to use. They picked the stuff off the toilets, the ha handles everywhere in the, in the Brockton school that you could think there might be um, germs. In, uh, and then that's where our bacteria was grew. We, that's where we grew our bacteria from was those germs in different places in the school. And so what we did is we made um, a tincture, which is uh, alcohol and uh, of course, the tincture alone would, you know, or the alcohol alone would probably kill the bacteria with echinacea. And of course, hands down, it killed all of it. And then we did um, a poultice. We just ground it into a poultice. And so um, a poultice is that fine powder that they would use for the snake bites. So we put it, we made it as a poultice and then a tea. And then the tea that we used was, um, we we made the tea and the stronger, the longer you that your tea is sitting in the medicines, the stronger it's gonna be, of course. And so we did the tea and we did it for like two weeks. So it was pretty nice, nice and strong. And every one of them killed the bacteria. It was uh, so we know that echinacea kills the bacteria. My second graders knew that echinacea kills bacteria. Um and um then there was another story my grandma told me too is she was helping a, she was helping a cowboy with his horse and he um he had a champion horse champion roping horse and um she said that she she he was her neighbor and um he called her and she said um you know asked her for help and um she told him go take your horse to the veterinarian. And he said, well, no, I believe in your medicine. And I did take my horse to the veterinarian. They said that we need to put him down, that he's not going to heal. He was really cut up from barbed wire. And then, then um, the wound was um, swollen and um, it was filled with pus, you know, and it was swollen. And so the, the veterinarian kind of gave up hope on the horse. And so that cowboy took him to my grandma. And so she's like, okay, why? So I'll help you. And uh, so she said, you just got to bring your horse. To me. And so she said that she um, lanced that horse's wound. She put the medicine in there and she um, and stuffed it with, um, with that um, sage and then wrapped it up and and changed it four times and so it, it only took four days to get rid of um that and bring down that swelling of, for that horse and that horse didn't have to get put down and so so that's another use for that echinacea or black root um there's a lot of different actual uses for it but it's really powerful and so those are like kind of the extreme extreme um uses and so then then there's this uh bitter root and so the bitter root 
it, um, I'm not very, um, we don't have bitter root around here. And so my uncle gets me bitter root, no, big mountains, we call them in, in the West. And so uh, he goes to the big mountains and gets the, gets the bitter root. But when my mom was on the, she was a legislator, um, they, she called me and she said that, you know, it was like real mid legislation and, and um, I don't know if you guys know like how legislation gets, I didn't know, but it gets, I guess it gets really, you know, complicated and people want their bills to be passed. You, and so it gets really, uh, no, the, the Nakota call echinacea black root. And let's see if my daughter got me uh, the name of it, black root. It's Chahutka Saba. So Chahutka Saba. And it's spelled C A H U T K A Saba, black root. And so, um, so um, she asked for some me to send her some mint and some bitter and um, and so bitter um, is is called the great mind medicine and I've read it in a few different places but it really helps you um, with your memory and alertness and clearness of thinking and when um, I was a single mother you know going to college like a lot of people are um, and um, and so my kids, I would put them to sleep, then I'd do homework, but I would have to have a clear mind because I was doing a lot of coursework. And so I would keep a little bit of that bitter by my computer and I'd just kind of chew on it while I'd work. And it would just kind of brighten you up, just chewing on that dry, you know, that root, just brighten you up. The feeling that I got was just, I was bright, bright, kind of alert but when I was done working I can go right to sleep so I really appreciated that bitter at night um when I when I used it it was at nighttime and it worked and so that's a trick for you for you that that really helped me and um and then uh and I tell you it worked okay and then then you have um bear and bearer is not so good. Um, and bearer is another good medicine. They, and, um, and so I use bearer for menstrual cramps. And, and I believe that is what the, um, the one of the main uses is for like, a, as like a pain medicine, menstrual cramps, echinacea could be like a pain medicine too, it numbs. And when you drink it, it, it helps that also is, uh, it helps numb that black root helps numb. And um, if you had a toothache, and you chewed on that, um, or if you put a little poultice of that um, black root on your tooth, it would numb, it really numbs your, your mouth pretty fast, that black root does. Um, and so then with the, with, uh, bear root, the, the use that I got from the bear root was for menstrual cramps and it really helped me, but I know there's a lot of, lot more uses for it, but that's the one that I kind of remember most. And, um, I'm still building my knowledge on, uh, our different plants, but these are all plants that, that, uh, you don't have to be, um, uh, you know, a medicine woman, or you don't have to go to sweat or the hill to get asked to use these. They're common uses that women use and um, women families use, but we always had these things um, for our families. And I encourage all of my students um, in, in this, in whenever we're working with them to, to use these as common medicines and to not confuse them with um, the in, like Indian medicines um, that you have to ask permission to use and things like that. And so um, these uses are for us all and we use them to also uh, share with, with our relatives, you know, um, you should have them for your family. Everybody should have these for, for their family. Okay, and so those are those ones. Okay, now, okay, that's more of that bitter. Okay, all right. And so one uh, time 
I um, made, we, we, I had, when we had the alternative school, we also had a sweat outside of our school. And so this is really a cute story, but we invited elders. We used to do this quite a bit and we haven't done that this year, just, just for, um, just once or twice this year so far, did we invite elders in. But when I had an alternative school, we were inviting them in more often. And so uh, the boys that I had for alternative school, um, some of them were expelled. Um, they, there, was, there was a reason why they had to be in alternative school. And a couple were expelled. Uh, a couple just were too fun and uh, too fun. And they had too much fun in class and school. And they kind of added a lot of disruptions. And so they, they were there. It, and so my alternative students were kind of supposed to be the tough students in the school. They were the biggest teddy bears ever. And so what I, what I did right away was um, I taught them how to offer. I asked one of my fellow instructors who was because they were all boys um, who was a man his name is John Stufferm I asked him to come and talk to the boys and he taught them how to um, offer tobacco to elders and how to accept um, when an elder tells you no or if an elder says um, yeah I can help you but they're not able to when it comes down to it how to react and so it just kind of shows you, uh, showed them a lot of communication. And so what we did was we made little tobacco pouches. And so, so all the stuff in this jar is all my stuff that we use to, um, to make our tobacco mix. And um, in this bag, this is the tobacco seeds. And so I'm gonna show you the little cone. So here's the tobacco seed here. And um, our, this is the pod. And so the seeds, there's like a hundred seeds in that little pod. You can't, I, you can't, can't even see them. They're so tiny, but just one of those little seeds could create a plant. And so then the plant that's back that we had came from the, um, the Ani Nakota College. And that's where we got the tobacco. And then we, uh, we got the shavings from in the month of March. Or was it the month of February? Sorry, of uh, red willow. So it's the in, it's the red willow, it's the inside of that. And so then we shaved it and we put it in this bag. And we still, I still, have, well, we had more, but this is what I have left. Um, and so this is what it looked like before. We took the the, uh, the mix out. It was like that red is it inside of that. Tashasha, the red red one. Tashasha. And then this one is the knick So it's like barb, and so it's this little plant, and it come. It looks like a. It's it's uh. It's round like this. And it just grows on the mountain forest. And so the way my Uncle Pete Big Stone said that you prepare that stuff is that you you get boiling water, you nice and boiling, you put it in there and then take it out and then bake it and then make it crunchy. And um, then we mixed it with real tobacco with no additives. Okay, the real tobacco, the knick-knick, the um the medicine from the um what's the willow again chashasha the red willow chashasha and then um mint a little bit of the mint and so we mixed that and we made some um we made a pipe mix for for the people that we asked and so I was telling you about the alternative kids. So then we made that and then we, um, the boys. And so, so these kids were like big kids. They're six, you know, well, not all of them were six foot, but there's like five of them that were six foot around their big boys. And so when we would go into the elders rooms or houses, they would, we'd call and they would be so happy. And then it would be all of these kids and myself and go in and um, they were so cute. The elders would just be so happy that we came to visit them and they would offer that tobacco to them and um, ask them to speak. 
and they would kind of surround the elders and uh, the elders it made them really happy and they came and spoke to all of the student body, not just the alternative school, but the alternative school students were the ones that brought them there. And, and so they would speak to them, but I thought that was the cutest story and it was really fun to watch. Um, but that's what we did is we made that tobacco mix. Um, uh, my uncle Pete Bigstone is the one who uh, taught me how to make it. And uh, he did that with his wife and they, um, and so they shared that with me. And, um, and then I shared that with my students and then we shared the, the mix with the elders and brought it into the school. And so those little things that we share with one another, it could really make somebody's day, you know, the way we use it. And that, that was the intention was to uh, use it in a good way and we did. And so that was our tobacco mix, okay. And then let me see what else I have back here. I'm, I'm kind of short on some plants because we use them a lot. Okay, so this one's fun, and we've been doing this this too. Uh, my past uh, language teachers, I told you I'm the principal at his large school. My past language teachers, they mean and Robin uh, Black Wolf, they made some of these also. So these are choke cherry patties right here, and so and uh, so. I tried these and they're sweeter than the actual choke cherries that you pick the day of or the, you know, right at the time. And so it does, they don't get stale, they get, they get better. And so that's, I think that's really cool. And so how you do that is um, you get the choke cherries and you grind them up in um, my Auntie Doty Bell, okay? So my Auntie Doty Bell, she, she's from Lodgepole and um, what the, the, the family that we come from that makes us all related is uh, Little Chief, where we all come from a, a man named Little Chief who came from the Cypress Hills and he moved um, uh, uh, his people to Lodgepole. And so his name was Little Chief. His his wife was one. It was singing Buffalo Woman. That's who I, who I'm named after. And their daughter was one woman, then Feather Woman, and um, down the line. And and so those are our grandmas. One, um, that's who who are who we come from is Little Chief in the Cypress Hills in Canada. And there are families um, it, at Fort Peck too that are related to Little Chief, and they came here at the same time. And uh, I believe that when they, I believe it was when they were hunting for Louis Real is when they came down here. I read an article when I was in Canada. It was at that, it was um, at that time. And um, it was pretty interesting, but I left the article and I wish I would have took it. Uh, it was very explanatory of the Real Rebellion and how the tribes moved. Um, and my aunt Dodie. Okay, back to my aunt Dodie. And so my aunt Dodie Bell, she I was given the right to cook for ceremonies. And so when I had my throwing a ball ceremony for my daughters, I went and saw her, and uh, and she and she eventually gave me the right to cook for ceremonies too. I had I cooked for ceremonies for a long time, sweats and different things, um, different ceremonies throughout, you know, my life. And um, and um, but now she gave me the right, and so I could teach other people and give them the right. But the main thing that she taught is that when you cook, you cook. Um, when you cook, you cook with a good heart, you smudge yourself, you tell, you know, that you're going to turn this food into medicine, and that you want to nourish your people, and you pray, you smudge the whole time that you're cooking for a ceremony, you can all, you just keep your smudge going, or, you know, you just smudge it here, keep it going, make it feel good, make your home feel good, you sing, pray, um, and when you, she said, and also when you stir, you just stir in that one directions so that you don't go in there all wild in your, your mind everywhere, but cooking, you don't go in there all angry, making food and making food fly. <laughs> you go in there all calm, you go in there calm, you go in there to, for the thoughts that you're making this food 
into medicine and then it, and so she she gave me that lesson and I share that lesson with the different kids especially my my own children and um and my students uh, and so when we had our um throwing the boss ceremony uh my aunt let me she she gave me that right to be able to cook for ceremonies <clears throat> but she also shared with me a really cool trick and so i'll share it with you and so choke cherries are really good and they're really a hard work when you grind them up but what she told me that she did and this is a trick that i'll always use now is that you could take your choke cherries and put them in a flour mill and they come out it so fine that they just melt in your mouth and then literally they melt in your mouth and it's heaven it's just heavenly having, uh, you know, choke cherries um, ground, ground so fine. And you know that it had to be um, a skill that was, that women had back in the days. Like, she, like her choke cherries are so fine. They melt in your mouth. You know, you would, you, I could totally see myself going to the camp that you knew that woman made choke cherries that will melt in your mouth. Cause I go to my aunt's house all the time to get choke cherries that melt in my mouth okay and so when um i would also it was not the class that did the echinacea it was a different class we um in brockton yeah sorry <laughs> there are a ton of questions about the choke cherries that got people oh, okay. excited sure. um, do you use the seeds as well yes okay the seeds have um you know the seeds are, you could see the seeds in here. That's why they melt in your mouth is because the seeds, when you grind them so fine, um, they, um, you don't, you know, you don't have to chew on them. They just, you just eat them. And so, but these ones are real thick because these are hand, these are hand ground ones. But, uh, you know, my aunt, she, she, she said that the best ones, you use the, the flour mill and, and you can use a flour mill, but these are hand hand pounded, and um, this do, our students do hand pounded also. But whenever I can get a flour mill, I'm get, I I'll do that. And so then when you dry them out, you let you make patties, you dry them out, and you turn them. You have to turn them often, and uh, just keep turning them, and they they'll then they dry out. And um, these turn uh, like these they, they last for a long time. Um, and they actually are sweeter, like I said, than if you um, go out and pick uh, choke cherries that day and make them. These are way sweeter. So do you, start with the do you start with the fresh berries or do you dry the berries first and then make the patties? Oh, um, no, you, um, so you grind the berries and then you just make them into these balls, flatten them out and set them out all over. And then in an hour or so, you flip them and you just keep flipping them. And if you wait one day to flip them, they will already get, um, they'll already start getting moldy. And so you have to flip them, right? Now, like if you even wait one day, they're going to start going bad. And so you just got to keep flipping them. Um, that's when you dry them, just dry them out. A lot of people use dehydrators and they're really fast. Um, and so then that so then the the choke cherries then after they're dried you can use them forever you just put them add water to them and cook them again but if you uh take choke cherries just from the the branch and you grind them up then um what we like to do is to add a little bit of lard with them um and make a make it kind of um a thicker a thicker substance um it, and then June berries are a little bit more watery than choke cherries, but gosh, they're good. And so choke cherries are very good medicine and choke cherries are the most plentiful fruit in Montana. That's they're everywhere, but they're, they're a very, very, very strong medicine. And so um, the inside of the medicine is, are inside of the choke cherries, that little seed, that seed can, uh, contains arsenic. A lot of people know this, you know, like, uh, what else does like uh, peach seeds and different seeds, you know, the inside, they have that little traces of arsenic. And so I don't know if it's the arsenic that does it, but um, that does it, 
but choke cherries and um, bison meat together, they're like one of the main cures for diabetes. Like if you, so I was telling, um, I was telling Jennifer that there's a study that uh, I, when I first started, I think college um, in Fort Peck, we had this uh, person come we had a lot of people present on plants. It was like Curly, Kiwi Conte, um, El Masnell. They're all really amazing people, you know, and more people than that too. They would come and share, you know, their plants and medicines. Well, Kiwi Conte uh, did a study. It's called the Strong Heart Study out of South Dakota. And, um, and, what, and what they did was they they did a kind of like a, a experiment on um, people with diabetes. And so the people, uh, so they had different people that were diabetic. They were all natives. And so one was a full blood or, and then, uh, or a couple were full blood and a couple quarter through our three fours, half quarter, all the way down, you know, into, um, to a person that um, didn't have any uh, native blood and so they what they did was these people all had di diabetes they gave them like uh, uh, every they always had um, pemmican buffalo pemmican and choke cherries mixed and so they always had it so I don't I'm not sure exactly how much they gave them but they had prescribed it as medicine so they eat it so many times a day and then um, they check their sugar and so the study showed that the people the full bloods with diabetic full bloods that ate the pemmican their blood sugar um, that did better was uh, lower than the three quarters all the way down to the quarter. So the more Indian you are, basically the more Indian you are, the better your um, body uh, responds to a pemmican as a medicine. And then another story about pemmican that I read was in this um, these journals, they're called the Nokonabi journals, Nokonabi. Um, and there was four of them. And they do not write them, but I'm looking, um, I have one of my librarian sisters helping me to, um, to get them republished because you can get things republished if, uh, you know, if, if you go do these steps. So she's going to help me see if I can get, get a couple more of them republished because I have four, the four of the, I have all four of them and they're so cool. They give you like history of the people at that time, which was maybe the nineties, early nineties. And then uh, um, food history, different, um, you know, war tactics, different. I mean, they're, they're just cool. They were just big magazines of just Nakona, Nakona stuff. And so, um, uh, geez, I just lost what I was saying. <laughs> and so, oh, the, oh, the, that, yeah, the um, strong hurt. And so, so that was one of the uses. And then the second use I got out of the Nakonabi. And what they did was they, they, um, took the, like the, any kind of dry meat, buffalo dry meat um, or deer dry meat, whatever, they would put, they would dry out all of the animal, they would put it on a hide and then they would flail it with willows until it became just this fine powder. Um, then they would put, mouth the animal fat, they would put the, all of the buffalo um, in, not all of it, but they would make these like cubes. And so they made bricks of buffalo meat and um, buffalo towel. And then they would sell those bricks. That was a trade item. And can you imagine like how happy those, uh, those settlers or whoever they were selling it to to were like these they were just little bricks of meat but they could you know sustain them in the wild for a long time and but you wouldn't have to carry much and so you and can you imagine like how um if you would get how happy you would be if you you would just feel like you can you know go out into the wilderness and 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 explore for days and so that was one of the things that they sold was that 
that buffalo meat and tallow. And so one of my science experiments that we did with my students is we wanted to know how much um, dry meat you can get out of one buffalo. And so we found the, like the average weight of the buffalo, the average weight of the bones in the hide. And so what was left was the meat. and. Um, so the average amount of meat that was on a buffalo and then we took a 10 pound roast and we dried it out and then we put it on a um a chart to find out to, and we went all the way down we used our algebra this was our second grade class to figure out how much dry meat we could get out of um a buffalo that was one of our projects and so they did all kinds of background knowledge um on the buffalo bison and um one of the things that we learned was that the bison has so many nutrients that nothing no animal um can compare to the amount of nutrients that a bison has and so the chart shows like the bison being a full 100 percent of the nutrients you could have and then the next closest was 50 percent of the nu nutrients that you could have and that was salmon and then after the salmon was the the wild game the deer and the the um the regular cow the regular beef is just a little bit it's like barely any nutrients and so the buffalo is itself is just medicine medicine itself you know and well of course all they do is graze medicine and um and then i had in and then also with my little experience i have with uh, foods and medicines I noticed that none of our wild medicines grow after you plant. And so the farmlands, there's you're not going to find any kind of medicines in farmlands. This is all in um in the you know the nature of the untouched, the untouched um parts of Montana. And I think that's why you know the reservation has so many medicines is we don't do a lot of farming. And so you can find a lot of your medicines around. And so the choke cherries in, in the um, buffalo, that there, if you just ate that alone, you would probably, you know, you would get enough nutrients to be a really healthy person. Um, and then we have our sweet pine. We burn sweet pine, women burn sweet, sweet pine in our area. And, um, and so we have very little sweet pine. And so we get uh, sweet pine from the, from the um, big mountains also. We have very little sweet pine around here. And so that's another thing that we get from the big mountains um, and in the West. And then we have our flat cedar. We, put, we have cedar here, but it's found more in the West than, than it is in our little Rockies. Um, we have a lot of sweet grass in our little Rockies here, and so we got a lot of sweet grass. That's one cool thing about our area. And um, let's see. Oh, yeah. Another trade item that I love, and so this was um, this is corn, and so this is the that Indian corn, and um. There, it's all like different colors of blue, red, purple. Um, there's even some yellow got snuck in there. You can't really see the colors, but here is. So I did a little. You know how teachers are. We're always doing little science experiments all all the time. So I planted a garden, and I planted my Indian corn, and I put on because it's all different colors. So I was like, okay, I wonder if red makes red. And so I, I planted it and I put red, purple, and it does. And so here is one of my reds in there. It's kind of small. And we I had, I had our garden by our sweat and, um, and one of our little girls that sweat with us, she's so cute, she's a little chubby girl. 
and um she would come and we were we were at sweat and she come by and she's like oh right now this is pretty good <laughs> and I looked at her and she had uh, she picked one of my corns one of my Indian corns <laughs> She was really eating it up. So I thought, oh, this is pretty good. So, so I tried it with her. I was like, it is pretty good. <laughs> but um, yeah, and so it's, you know, the corn is tastes like regular corn, just a little bit more hearty. Um, and uh, and the, the experiment is that if you do kind of blue on your, your corn is going to come out blue. But gosh, aren't they beautiful? And they grow just as good as anything else that I planted. In fact, I felt like my Indian corn came up better than my yellow corn. And um, then later I found out you're not supposed to um, put your corns by each other because they'll, you know, they'll cross pollinate. And so then it will make it not as um, bright. And so that's, that's pretty much all that I have to share with, with um, that I have here to share with you. If you have any questions, we can do questions. And, um, and then um, I wanted to share some of the, my book choices that I like, because um, with, with, when, you know, when you, when you get into uh, learning about something, you find different resources that you, that just speak to you and there's a few books and it, it was they I learned a lot about plants but what I learned in the books was our what I liked about the books was the storytelling of it you know of how they cook like you just get into the atmosphere of the women you know um cooking in the book and that's in and that's kind of what I wanted to talk to you about next is these different books. Okay, so do you have, should we do questions or the books? Let's do the books first. And then uh, we do have some really good questions. I've been trying to jot them down between both the chat and the Q and A. So um, yeah, talk about the books. And then when you see me pop on, then um, okay. know, it'll be, I just want to leave enough time for the questions because some of them are really good. Okay, cool. Okay, so my very first book that I really got into that um like i told you my um uh, my relative is i uh, elma snell her husband what is bill snell in uh, he his mother lena buck snell um she had a her place was hooked on right onto ours and so it was down in the valley where we grew up and it was just like our place and then theirs was right next to us and so uh they were always to me they always uh because Lena was, um, Lena was the elder, you know, and so they, they were kind of younger, they're older than my folks, but they're not, um, they, they weren't the same age as my folks, and so uh, they were still grandmas and grandpas, but they weren't the old, the old, the elder elders at the time, and so when um, they, when they were at their young ages traveling around, um, they brought us, when they would come to Fort Belknap, they brought us the book Pretty Shield. And the book Pretty Shield is the story of Grandma Alma's grandmother who raised her. Pretty Shield raised um, Alma. And so Alma was given, uh, given a gift and it was foods, cooking. And then her daughter, her sister was given a gift of beading because Pretty Shield in her books, it was, her books were awesome. Her book is awesome. It, it gave you a lot of voice. Um, you know, the feeling, the feel of the books and uh, the feel of the people through the books. Um, that Pretty Shield is really good, great about that. And so um, that was my first book. But what I took take out of that book or what the, my favorite part of the book to share with somebody is, is that when they talk about the chief goes, goes ahead in his wife. And so uh, his wife was in the, in the story was um, Alma's like, no, goes ahead's wife was pretty shields um, idol, not Alma's pretty shields idol. And so pretty shield was just a, you know, a youth at that time and in during Buffalo chaser days. And that's like, that's not even very long ago. Cause you, you think of it pretty shield Alma, and then us, you know, it's like, that wasn't very long ago. It seems like forever. And so uh, the wife goes ahead's wife. Um, she had the prettiest 
uh, Tipi. It was always white and fresh and freshly painted. And her daughter too, she had her little teepee and it was always white and freshly painted. So that means it was really clean, well taken care of, always painted. And then when you go into her home, she it, it says that it always smelled like sweet grass and the buffalo robes were never left out. And so that means that they always picked up, she always picked up at her, her place was really clean. And she, and she would say that even though I was just a little girl uh, uh, visiting, um, I was nobody, you know, famous that, that, that uh, goes ahead wife treated her like she was uh, someone really special. And so when she came in, it was always smelled like smudge and she always offered her tea and food and, um, and she just described her as being um, just this beautiful person. And so I always tell my students, you know, you gather like who you want to be from all these different people and, uh, and what about them that you, you want to be like. And so I always read that part to my students because not only does it show a man taking care of his family, but a woman taking care of her family. And it just, it has a lot of, a um, lot of, um, love in that in that part and then um her second book was that i really took to his grandmother's grandchild and um that was more about elma and growing up in one of my favorite parts in there is what she's talking about my uh, uh grandpa bill uncle bill he um like she bill he, uh she said that you know, he was really handsome in Assiniboines, Nakotas. We have strong medicine, <laughs> but in her um, book, it tells about it. It's uh, if you read Grandmother's Grandchild, you're gonna get the the feeling of of love and uh, um, what it's like to be an Indian woman or, um, with a family. You know how you you show your best and it tells you about this one part when she was getting, um, she was feeding uh, some people out, outside of her house um, at, in the foothills um, of the Bighorn Mountains and Yellowtail. And so it tells that she has her teepee up and her shades up in, in, our, in, our, in, in our country, in Lodgepole area, um, at the agency, we always had shades up. And so the shades brought you outside, you know, and that, they cooked under there. And so you can imagine just the feeling of it. And so she had her teepee set up and then the shade and then picnic tables. And, um, and then there was wildflowers on the tables and vases. And then the food that she prepared it was, um, for that meal was all our traditional foods, but it was presented in, in um, the most beautiful way that a woman could present a meal, you know, to her visitors. And, and so those little parts in there is what kind of really hits you. And then there's another one um, that called, um, of, co of course, uh, Taste of Heritage. That one has all, oh, I just love the, the, her voice, that how they captured her voice in that book because she tells these little uh, stories throughout it and they're so cute. They were so cute. I just remember so many uh, um, times when she'd visit because she was like a movie star to me. You know, uh, when when they would come, it was, we was just like in awe of her. My mom was like in awe of her. Everybody was, we were just, th they, we thought of them like movie stars and what was what was so awesome about them <laughs> to make them movie stars is like they were just the way they were you know they weren't they uh they were artists with words and food and uh and how they shared with people it was just that's what made them uh movie stars to us our stars to us but we just admired them and um, our whole family really admired them and then uh, the next book was uh, the ways of our grandmothers that one I love that one it's uh, about the Blackfeet uh, of Blackfeet families and they talk about Sundance time and how things were done at Sundance and how you cooked on on a fire and um and you you know the stones that you use because I'm part uh, my grandpa was from Mexico you know and so I really love to cook uh, Mexican food but I like to cook homemade Mexican food and um, and so to me all those stories just kind of 
hit me. Um, and then there, let's see what else. Then there's, there's more books. Like there's uh, two old women. They show a lot of how to prepare foods and how, how to be, um, how to just like be working constantly working and preparing. And then I like this book too. This one is, uh, Beaver Bison and Horse. This to me, this book right here talks about um, our prairies and the ecology of the plains. Um, like it's a narrative. It's a, it's a, and so I share this one with my students too because it reads like a narrative, you know, and then it's expository. And then I love this book, Bought Me in a Day. It's, it, it's just wonderful. It has all different kinds of plants in uh, descriptions of it, but botany in a day is a really great field guide too. And so those are just some of the books that I love. Um, what I do is um, make sure that we always have them in our libraries and um, available to our students. Uh, um, I'm of course, um, you know, I like the the voice of women and because I'm a woman and cooking. And so those are the kind of the books that I'm leaning towards, but that's why. And so we could do questions now. Awesome. Um, and so A Taste of Heritage, uh, Pretty Shield and Grandmother's Grandchild, uh, Two Old Women um, should be in most public school libraries in Montana as sent out from Indian Ed. So um, check your libraries for those. If you can't find them, contact me and we'll see what we can do to, um, to get you those. So thank you for those. Um, let's see. One of the questions I had as well, and that was about Panacea and, um, you know, coneflower. So you know, you see the cultivars when you go to the nurseries. And of course, um, Echinacea purpurea is a very, very uh, geographically specific plant. So uh, do they share medicines or are they different? The black root, the Echinacea? Yeah. Okay, share medicines with? The cultivar, like, you know, the cultivars that aren't Echinacea purpurea uh, um, specifically, which are okay. I am not sure, actually. I don't know that. Um, if they do, I, but I was just, I was curious because otherwise, you know, that would be, that would be great, great medicine. Um, and then I, could you share with us or share with me, um, and I'll bug you for it, the place to access the graphic that shows the amount of sustenance provided by different animals? So what I looked for was the, I looked for, uh, I think it was because they have a lot of stuff is that Denver, in Denver, they have a, um, does anybody know the name of it? <laughs> I just got over COVID and I can't believe I didn't cough once, but um, it's, it's, uh, but they take the buffalo down there. That's where it, it's in, um, it's in South uh, Rapid City, South Dakota. Well, the inner uh inner tribal bison yeah they have a lot of resources yeah. on their site linked on our on our website mm -hmm. the bison resources and i believe um i put those resources with another presentation so some of these like a botany in a day it's so cool to see these um and that's a Montana author by the way um thomas elpel so um so is uh beaver bison and horse christina eisenberg she does a she does a um, class with our students, and they are restoring and not with our students, but at Fort Belknap, um, indigenous plants, and then they re record them. And awesome. she, she's, she's pretty awesome here. I've heard that one before. Yeah, um, she's like a narrative. You'll be you'll love it. Okay. I'm, 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 I have so many books to read now. <laughs> um, so we have um, seven minutes left, just so oh. you know. Um, and Naomi is wondering, what can you share about the elderberry and also about eating their seeds? So I have elderberry here too. Or no, that was, that's juniper berry. I'm not, um, I'm not much for, I don't know much about the elderberry, but that is something that I've been meaning to, um, to educate myself on culturally. 
I haven't, I have yet to find somebody to teach me about it yet, but if you find out anybody, let me know, and I would, I really do want to know, because it is, it's plentiful here too. And um, I, I was wondering, is the, the cedar that you referred to, is that actually the eastern red cedar, and is that actually juniper? Is there a difference between the western cedar and the eastern red cedar? It's called flat cedar. We call it flat cedar. Um, I tried some of that for my, uh, I made a, a recipe out of the sous chef, uh, his cookbook. Um, and it was the, the bison braised uh, with, with uh, the cedar. And I couldn't get cedar, but I tried it with the Eastern red cedar, which is really juniper and it was a little bitter, but it was still really deep. Yeah, the juniper has like finer little, you know, ends to them. And the flat cedar is just flat and it's kind of wider. It's not the, the it, it look, they kind of look the same, but they're not, you can tell, you can tell when they're side to side that they're pretty, they're different. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, one, one other thing that Alma showed up me one time was um, to cook a whole onion with the skins in, in um, your squash. And then it adds, um, it adds a whole ton of flavor and nutrients. Then you just take the onion, onion out, but you don't leave it in there. You just cook it together and it adds nutrients and flavor. Um, any suggestions on where to purchase a rooting bar? And um, could it be used for nodding onions as well? And do you think preschoolers could utilize this tool for harvesting? Now, I've only seen someone use a, a rooting bar, which was basically made from a crowbar. So I can't imagine a preschooler, but I've seen the, the Salish um, tool for harvesting spetlum is generally made out of, you know, um, wood, so. Yeah, okay, so the old school rooting bar is choke cherry, the, the, the base of the choke cherry. And then that one, and so I made one before and I, I moved here. So I, I moved into this house from a house that I lived. Can't find it, I've been looking all over for it. And so when, um, so I made one that had a curve to it. And so my kids would just go in the, and that's what they, I said that that was done when you were uh, digging turnips, you would have your kid, you know, you, it was a big affair, like the family affair would go out and the kids would find the turnips and they would either help try to dig them or wait for you to get there. And so my, I'd give my kids those little things and they would get in there good. But the rooting bar, um, there was like, so the place that made them was called Greens. It was uh, um, it, in uh, Wolf Point by Pumpkin Hill and Wolf Point. And so uh, Greens, they had a bunch of junk cars there. It's like a junkyard. They also, he also built a house out of tires. Um, and so he has that there too, but he made all these different uh, running bars. And so he welded them in part. And so the one that I had, because I saw different ones was like out of, um, so the one I had the, it had a pick on it and the pick was like this. And then the bar was like that, right? That straight up. So that pick was at an angle and you, anyway, I think anyone can make them. But what was really good about that um, rooting bar was that it was heavy and heavy enough to really get in there, but light enough where you can just carry it around. But no, the kindergartners couldn't carry it. We gave them those little sticks that, those little bowed sticks from the choke cherries, and that's what they would use. They they take a long time. To, it takes a long time though. In those rooting bars, just boy, they jump out of the ground. Oh, that's that. Mm -hmm. I I would love to do that with you. I want to come visit you this summer. <laughs> a lot of my friends do, and because I lived at Fort Peck for a while, and this country is way different than it is at Fort Peck. But I tell you, there is a big difference because, you know, Fort Peck, it's all in that Bakken area. Their turnips are always like two or three times bigger than ours oh, wow. at, at the same time. Because <clears throat> I always watch for my friends when they, they do theirs. As soon as theirs starts, then I wait a little while because ours is not even close to being ready when theirs are. <laughs> but our June berries hang off 
the branches like grapes, you know, when everybody else just has little tiny ones. <laughs> well, unfortunately, we are out of time, but Raina, thank you so much. I, I know we didn't get to all of the questions and um, there is one uh, from a teacher here in Helena about um, uh, different types of medicines and, and who can share those. And, and so I, I, I'm gonna send that one to you because it's a, it's a really good question. Okay, all That's right. Thank you so much. The feedback survey is open. Please make sure that you all uh, get to that before tomorrow and let us know what you think and how we can improve. I am planning an ethnobotany workshop, which will be over two Saturdays. And I am kind of hoping that Raina might give us a cooking demonstration for one of them. And yeah. We will stay tuned on that. And also, please um, tentatively pencil in May 14th and 15th for our 15th annual Indian Education for All Best Practices Conference. It will be virtual again this year. It will be free again this year. And it is sure to be um, a really exciting experience as we are uh, combining forces with our new Indian Student Achievement Director, Carrie Gopher, and our new language language revitalization expert Matthew Bell and Donnie Wetzel, who many of you know over the Tribal Relations and Resiliency Unit. And uh, so we'll have Native Youth Voices as well as part of the conference. So stay tuned, watch our website for that. And March 1st will be our final ethnobotany webinar, and that will be with Shane Sangri covering Cree knowledge of, of plants of Rocky Boy. So thank you all so much for being here tonight. I hope you all stay well. I hope you all stay healthy. And uh, thank you again, Raina, for such a wonderful, wonderful uh, presentation. Thank you.